Hello everybody, this is James Shore with another Test Driven Development video. When we left off, I was getting the first row working, and you can see that I've got some of it going. Uh, year starting balance, starting principal withdrawals, just getting the rest of it in. And then once we get that in, we can do multiple years, and I'm excited about getting that in. Okay, so, um, so we're repeating our, our calculation here. And as I was saying in the last video, I could use mock objects to not repeat myself, um, to not actually tie my test here to the implementation of my stock and market year over here. Because right now, if I change the way that interest rate calculation works, this test will fail. And that's a little bit bogus because um, I don't want this test to fail if I'm legitimately refactoring over here. Uh, I mean, if, I'm, if I make a mistake over here, I just want the stock market year test to fail. But I'm not so worried about that. Um, what I'm more worried about is if I legitimately refactor this and I change the way the test works, and I think this is all fine, I may not remember that this code, this stock market table model, relies on that same calculation. So when that happens, I don't mind if this fails. I kind of like it to fail. I'm not going to go out of my way to test absolutely everything all the way through because that just gets ridiculous and you do end up with too many failing tests. But I like having extra things fail to sort of help me see how things fit together. The problem arises when you've got everything failing because you change one thing over here and then you've got to spend a huge amount of time changing your tests somewhere else. We don't want that, but if that happens, I think that's a sign that you've got design problems. They have too much coupling that you don't have clean interfaces. So I actually don't use mock objects very often. I tend to avoid them. It's the classicist mindset as opposed to the mockist mindset. Um, some people like to go top-down using mocks to drive the implementation as they go. I don't claim to understand that approach very well, but it's very popular. Um, and I think the preeminent book describing that would be Steve Freeman, uh, I believe it's Steve Freeman's book, uh, Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. I've heard very good things about that book, although I haven't read it yet myself. So if you want to see more about the mock mockist approach, which is more of a top-down approach that uh, stubs out each layer using mocks, um, check out his book. Uh, Steve Freeman and Nat Price, of course, um, were the ones who invented the mock object technique. So they really know their stuff. Um, I've used mocks before, never really gotten it. Uh, I need to read their book to understand how they do it. But uh, I prefer not to use mocks. So, And if you don't understand what mocks are, no worries. Uh, I'm sure there will be an occasion where we actually do want to use them. So just keep watching. Okay, so this is failing. Oops, I did a little refactoring when I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> Oops. All right, so uh, return market year, and this should be, I called it appreciation, but here we call it interest earned. I think appreciation is probably more correct, so let's go ahead and change that. Now, by renaming this method here, I've now ensured that some of my stock market year tests have funky names, like they'll say interest earned instead of appreciation in some of their comments. Um, and that's just the way it is. Uh, I'll fix it when I go into those tests again. I've, once your program gets to a certain size and you do these automated renames, your stuff gets out of wax. And that's why I try to avoid having the same name here as I have for my method names. It still happens. Um, and it's just too much hassle to try to change your test names and your test descriptions every time you change something else. You just have to kind of rely on it still making enough sense when somebody else comes along. Okay, so let's get the rest of this going. Um, appreciation. Next is deposits. Well, we, hmm. we don't have deposits in our model. So let's take that out. We will get deposits in eventually, but they're not in there yet. And I don't feel like putting in a null or, or just hacking in a do-nothing method into the model. Uh, okay, so after deposits, we're in the balance. So the ending balance should be That 
that should fail. All right, there we go. We have our first row. Um, now, notice I, I did not test, despite liking having this fail if I make some change to the underlying model that invalidates my assumptions, I'm not going to test everything. I'm not going to actually do a withdrawal right now because I trust that stock market year is coded properly. I trust that all this is going to do the right thing. I don't need to test those calculations again. What I'm really doing is testing that it shows up in the model properly. And coincidentally verifying that I'm using that the model if the model changes um, that this will break but that's not what I'm going for uh, it's just sort of a fringe benefit and some people would call it a, a fringe detriment but I think of it as a benefit okay let's get multiple rows in um, let's actually call this one row, and uh, this will call multiple rows. How many rows do we want? I think, so because this is about predicting into the future and predicting into retirement, um, really what we need to do is go from now, this year, to when we're going to die, which is, <laughs> which is always kind of a fun little thought exercise because the longer you live, the more money you need in retirement, which means the less money you have now. Um, but you don't want to say you're going to die soon either. So <laughs> anyway, um, so let's say that for now we're just going to live 50 years. Um, and I think, I think what I want to do is say starting year and ending year. Let's go to 2050. Nice round number. That, of course, is not going to work. Again, this is all stuff code. It's just so I can do my desk check. We will come in and fix this up somehow. Okay. So I want to assert that the number of rows is 40, 2050 minus 2010. Um, actually, no, I want it to be 41 because I want the first year to be 2010 and the last year to be 2050, so it's inclusive. Okay, get row count. That should fail. Hard code that. I mean, I don't. Hard coding that's a little cheesy. The reason I do it is I want to get a green bar, uh, and the reason for that is when you refactor, um, you can make mistakes that cause the test to fail, and you're not. At least I'm. I'm moving pretty quickly. I don't want to study the error messages every time. So I want to get a green bar before I refactor, so that if I make a dumb mistake and it causes something else somewhere to fail, I'll see that red bar and I'll catch it right away. Um, now I do really small refactorings, and that's actually harder than it looks. It takes some practice. Um, so the chances of me making those dumb mistakes is lower, but it still happens. Um, and by having a green bar, if, if I've caused something to fail, I catch it right away. Whereas if I kept the red bar, I'd have to check the error message every time. Did I break something? Did I break something? This, you know, I want to reduce the mental burden. Oh, 
Okay, I did not expect that to fail. Aha, see? <laughs> that was not intentional, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. I may not have noticed if I had left that bar red. Okay, so that's working. And I think I want to assert that the first year Yes, I'm repeating myself here a little bit uh, because I'm already testing this up here, but I think it makes the test read a little more clearly. So that should pass. And then the last year, because it's inclusive, that's a tricky little thing. You can get a fence post error. I want to assert that we're actually getting that last year. And that should fail. Yeah, I expected 2050 was 2010. So, um, yes, yes, that's <laughs> really nasty. <laughs> we'll fix it in a moment. Um, I want to just check that my assumptions are correct, though. So I, the first row should be 2010. Well, I guess we're not. That's uh, not going to check anything. I need to see it go up by one. OK, um, well, I'm going to factor this out into a method. Let's see, call. Uh, Oh, what are you doing? Stop that. Let's factor this out. Get row value. I don't know. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. It's interesting. Well, let's, I'm going to cheat so badly here. That should work. That does. And that allows me to verify do my desk check. Yep, there's our 2010, 2011, and it does stop at 2050. So I just wanted to make sure that my, because that is a weird little inclusion thing, I wanted to make sure I wasn't making any dumb mistakes. Oh good, it is read only. Okay, um, that's just a polish thing. We're going to have to come back through here and, you know, make it pretty and put lines down the sides and, you know, alternating colors for the rows and so forth. Okay, so what do we need to do next? Um, well, clearly, we need to assert um, the uh, something that's actually calculated. And I don't think I'm going to have a chance to get this in. I'll just get the test working. That should work. Completion always bugs me. Okay, that should fail. That's where we'll pick up next time. So thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.